Good morning, everybody. Please stand as we... Please turn off the music, Kathy. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. Just so you know, Will, we just got applause. You probably didn't hear it, but <laughs> just kidding. Anyways, I um, want to welcome everybody to Holly Nance this morning. And we really miss our worship leader, uh, but he gets a well-deserved family time. So we're thankful that he gets to have that time today. And in the meantime, Sandy and I stepped up the plate, and we're here to worship and sing with you guys, and we're excited. We're excited because the Holy Spirit's here. And we know the Holy Spirit's here, right? He always starts our services out. I'm going to say a prayer now. And um, I also want to put a prayer out there for Pastor Dan, who is also not here today. He is in the White Mountains. And from what Ed has told me, the White Mountains are pretty treacherous terrain. And he's out there having fun doing treacherous terrain. So we're going to pray for his safety and his return whenever he comes back to his family and us. All right, Father God, we just want to thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the bodies that are, are here today and the ones that are online watching. Father, we just ask you to bless this service. Let us hear from Ed what you want us to hear, and let us take those nuggets out of here and just spread them wherever we go. Father, we just thank you. We give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
121, 1 to 2. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God 
So today we are privileged to have my husband, Preacher Ed, come and give us his word today. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see everybody here today, and we're happy to have you folks online as well. I always feel uh, very humbled whenever I believe the Lord has given me a message to uh, spread to other people. And today is no different. I'm feeling uh, a little nervous, a little excited, but very humbled all at the same time. Don, would you come up, please? Don's our expert today. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are with us always all times, every day, to walk with us, that you lead us, and that you love us. Father, bless all of those who give today and who give online. And, uh, we're just so thankful that your church family is rising up to face, face the needs of the church, Father. Amen. In 2007, a group of 23 South Korean Christian missionaries were captured by radical Islamist Muslims, the Taliban, in Afghanistan. Now, they were terrified. The Taliban separated them into groups, isolated them, and confiscated their possessions. One of the Korean women managed to hold on to her Bible, ripped it in 23 parts and gave a piece to all of her fellow missionaries. That way they could read scripture whenever they were not being watched. The group knew that the Taliban had decided to kill them one by one and let us know. One by one the missionaries surrendered their lives again to Jesus. Saying, Lord, if you want me to die, sake, I will. Then their pastor said, I talked to the Taliban, because they are going to start killing us one by one. I told their leaders that if anyone dies, I die first, because I am their pastor. Another said, no, because I am also a pastor, and I am your elder. I die first. The first pastor replied, you are not insane. I have been ordained. I die first. And sure enough, sadly, he did. Two of them were killed before the rest were eventually rescued. They had demonstrated extraordinary loyalty to God, Jesus, and each other. You know, loyalty is a combination of love and faithfulness. Loyalty is a quality that's often lacking in our society today. This loyalty destroys friendships, families, churches, businesses, political parties, and even entire nations. Of course, loyalty does not mean never speaking up. Quite the reverse. It has been said, loyalty means I am with you whether you are wrong or right. But I will tell you when you are wrong, and I will help you to get it right. Even though Jesus was never wrong, don't we have an obligation as Christians to help the church get it right? To help each other and Jesus' family to get it right? Don't we have an obligation to pass on our faith to others? 
Don't we have an obligation to pass on our faith to the next generation? And my little granddaughter today, her very existence is less than that. And I looked at her, and I look at her grandmother, a woman who's been with me close to 40 years. And I think that is how God loves us, the way I love them, the way I love that child. You know, I wouldn't care. I mean, I care what she does. I don't want to say it wrong. But my love for her is so intense that it would make no difference for my love for her, what she does that is considered right or wrong. I mean, I love her unconditionally. And that's how Jesus loves us. It is no wonder that these Korean missionaries realizing the full love of Jesus, facing their deaths, would recommit themselves to our Lord. I believe that all organizations, because they're made up of people, have a tendency to get things wrong. Instead of leading the organizations that we're part of, our work, our jobs, our church, instead of leaving, don't we need to show loyalty and help our churches to get it right? I think we do. That's why I'm standing up here. We need to get it right. Now we're talking about these Islamic terrorists, these Taliban, these Muslims. And us in the Christian world, sometimes we have a very harsh opinion of these people. But you know, we also have those in the Christian world who do heinous and horrible things. Truth of the matter is that Christianity and Islam are similar. And I'm going to go into that a little bit. Christianity and Islam are the two largest religions in the world. Christi Christians are believed to be numbered at 2.2 billion people, which is 31% of the world's population. Muslims, who are believers in Islam, comprise about 1.5 billion people. Did I say billion for the Christians? I meant to. Uh, 1.5 billion believers, and it's the fastest growing of the major religions. Together, that is a total of 3.7 billion people, or nearly half the world's population. We think of Muslims, those who believe in Islam, as believing radically different than we do. But we do have a lot in common. Christianity started about 2,000 years ago with the death of Christ. And Islam started about 700 years later, 1,300 years ago, with the beginning of the ministry of the prophet Muhammad. So who do Muslims think that Jesus is? In Islam, Jesus, this is kind of neat, they got a little title for him, Jesus, i got to say this right. In Islam, Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, is one of the five great messengers of God who are collectively known is the Ul Azam, or the possessors of steadfastness. This is written by a Muslim, by the way, just so you know. Jesus is considered a real person who lived in Roman Judea in the first century of the Common Era. Muslims share with Christians most of the basic outlines of Jesus' story, though there are certainly differences. In Islam, as well as in Christianity, Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary, and was without a father. But for Muslims, Jesus is neither God nor the Son of God. Like all messengers of God in Islam, Jesus came to his people with a message. Jesus' message is called the Injil or the Gospel. As in the Christian tradition, he is a miracle worker and a healer. He gave sight to the blind and brought the dead back to life. The Koran as additional miracles ascribed to Jesus. For example, Jesus speaks from his cradle and makes a bird out of clay and breathes into it to turn it into a real bird. Now, what is the significance of these additional miracles? These miracles each occur for a specific reason. Let's take the example of Jesus speaking from his cradle. After he was born, Mary took the baby Jesus to her people. But they accused her of adultery. They said, Mary, you have committed a terrible thing. Without speaking, she pointed at the baby. 
as if, don't ask me, ask him. And the baby answered. According to the Quran, Jesus said, I am indeed the servant of God. He has given me the book and made me a prophet. He made me blessed wherever I am and advised me of prayer and charity as long as I live. He made me kind to my mother and he never made me arrogant or disobedient. Beyond believing Jesus is one of the five elite messengers of God, Muslims believe that Jesus will return to bring justice to the world. Muslim theologians call this the descent of Jesus to earth. This end time return of Jesus is unique among the prophets of their God. So why is Mary, the mother of Jesus, so important to the Quran? Mary is the only woman mentioned by name in all of the Quran. Where's Mary? It's not so bad in the Christian Bible. Mary is the only one that's mentioned by name in the entire Quran. And in chapter 19, there's a book named after her, the book of Mary. Her father and mother are mentioned as virtuous people. According to the Quran, her mother was a constant worshiper and asked God to give her a son so, so that she could dedicate him to the temple. God accepted her prayer, but did not give her what she wanted. He gave her Mary, who would be the mother of Jesus. In Islam, the birth of Jesus is considered miraculous, the only such example in human history. Some Quranic verses tell us that God revealed his message to Mary, but told her that when her people asked her about her baby, she would remain silent. Because of this divine revelation, some Muslim theologians consider her a prophet of God. The prophet of Islam describes her as the highest woman in paradise, literally the master of the women of paradise. So you see that there's a lot of parallels amongst what they believe and what we believe. But there is one huge difference. We know that Jesus has been there since the beginning. He is God. He's of God. Who do Christians say Jesus is and why should we remain loyal to him and his church? Jesus Christ is the one and only he remains, to say the least of it, he is unique. If God, I want you to listen to this, if God is like Jesus, then God is worth worshiping. If God is like Jesus, God is worth believing in. That was written by the journalist Anthony Burgess. The whole of John's gospel, from start to finish, is an answer to the question, who is Jesus? John's answer is that God is like Jesus, and Jesus is the same as God, and that they are worth believing in. Jesus is totally unique. He is the one and only. He is the one-of-a-kind God expression. The purpose of John's gospel is to lead you into an experience of communion with God through friendship with Jesus. Jesus has always been and always will be. Everything that was created was created through Jesus. He and the Father are one. Jesus is our Savior, our Lord, our God, our Shepherd, our Friend, our Messiah, our Salvation, and our Eternal God. We believe that the ultimate victory of God came with life, death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. and the outpouring of his spirit, as Dan talked about at Pentecost. He gives us the power to live a life of victory. Now, who does Jesus say that Jesus is? Jesus clearly said that he was the Messiah. When the Samaritan woman at the well said she knew that the Messiah was coming, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. That's in John 4:26. He twice acknowledged that he was the Christ, that is, the Messiah. Matthew 16, verse 17, and, verse, and Matthew 26, verse 64. Then in John 10, verse 24, the people surrounded him and asked, 
how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in the Father's name. But you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, for my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. So either Jesus was a liar, or he was a lunatic, or he is God. We have no other options. Now, if half the world believes in Jesus, and, they, and half the world thinks that he is something special, why is it such a big step to understand that he is the ultimate special? He is the reflection and embodiment of God himself. He is one with God. In John 10.30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one, directly linking himself with God the Father and thus claiming his deity, his Godship. While Jesus did not say the exact words, I am God, he did clearly say he is God in a way that those who listen to him would understand. What did Jesus tell us his mission is, and therefore our mission as his church? Jesus said in Matthew 18, 12, 14, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than the other 99 that never wandered away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones shall perish. God wants all of his children to be with him. Luke 15. Luke uh, was more of a historian and he tried to get everything exactly right. And he said, also the parable of the sheep, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to hear Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness? and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Now, when I was a young man, I mean a kid, wasn't quite a teenager yet when this first started to happen, I had a belief in God, but I also had a very sick mother who suffered from mental illness all of my life. And I would pray she would continue to get sick. It was a cyclical thing. She was a schizophrenic. So as soon as the days started to shorten in October, I could see the signs that she was going to be ill again. Then at some point, we'd have to put her in an institution. And six or eight months later, she would come home again. So I was praying, Lord, if my mother loves you, heal her. And sometime 
four or five years later, I gave up on God. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to heal my mother, and he chose not to do that. I became very angry as a young man, very angry with God. I ran from him. I ran and I hid from him. I stayed angry. But Jesus doesn't want to lose any of us. So when I think of this parable, this is how I envision it. Here's Jesus. Sharon and Gordon, okay. Deb's here. Elizabeth is here. Ann and Brinley's here. Judy. That guy I met not too long. Oh, Bruce and Sheila. Robert's here. Terry's here. Kathy's here. Donna's here. I can never remember your names. So they are here. Mary's here. Andy. Where's Eddie? I don't see him. Where'd he go? Eddie, where are you? I am hiding. I do not want to hear the voice of the Lord. But he keeps coming. He keeps looking. He doesn't give up. Where are you? And he's looking over here and he's looking over there. He's looking low and he's looking high. He hasn't given up on me. I've given up on him. Where are you, my son? Where are you? Oh, there you are. No, no, don't be ashamed for leaving me. I have never loved you. No, you come with me now. I want to take you back home. Well, he found me all right. And he carried me on his shoulders. And he said to all of you, rejoice with me. We have found our lost sheep. Why do we love Jesus? Because he first loved us. We don't have to go the way that the Koreans did. But you know what? It's time that we re-give ourselves to the Lord. That we understand what the mission is. What is the mission? The mission is about saving souls. Sometimes as a church we forget this. My brother called me. He doesn't call me. My wife knows this. 30 years has never called me. I'll call him every once in a while just to make sure he's alive. I love him. He's a great guy. But for whatever reason, he just does not call. I was telling somebody about this. The very next day, I get a phone call. And it's my brother. He had gotten a vision from God, and he needed me to know. And he said to me, and I was amazed when I started doing this, putting this sermon together. He said to me, Ed, Jesus is so disappointed. And I said, why? He says, 30%. That's all he's got is 30%, which is almost the exact number that I found out of this article. 30%. He's not happy with 30%. He wants everyone. Why has the churches forgotten this? He says his churches aren't looking for people to save. And he wanted me to give this message. So when God speaks, I don't care if he speaks to my brother, speaks to me, or he speaks to one of you, when God speaks, we should listen. Now, I'm going to have an invitation today if you want to Sit here on this booth up here, or if you want to be at the altar, if you want to ask Jesus to be a bigger part of your life, if you want to recommit yourself to him, if you want to just recommit your loyalty to him in the church, 
If you wouldn't mind, if you just join me up here and we can pray together. Lost my young people back there. Father, we're just so thankful for your great and amazing love, Father. We just want to make a showing here that you are our focus, and we want to do your will, and we want to carry out your mission so that those that we love, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, we are passing on your message to them. And we're reaching out to our friends and our neighbors and we're passing on your message to them, Father. We know what your mission is. You want no one to be lost to you. And Father, we love you so much for that. So Father, please accept our offering of ourselves to you today. Jesus, we are so thankful that you are part of our lives and that you have sent your spirit to us so that we can be with you always. Why, we have you for eternity, starting the day that we chose you. You died for everyone so that everyone could be saved. And we have one response, and that's to accept your offer, to spend eternity with you, Father. And boy, we accept, we accept excitedly. Amen. Sunday school is in about 15 minutes. Yes. Unless nobody wants to.